Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance to learn more about the P-51 Red Tail and a Tuskegee Airman who flew it. I'm here with Brad Ling, who uh, just flew this uh, P-51 Mustang Redtail in. Uh, can you tell us a little about the uh, flight and the significance of it, Brad? Sure. The airplane is based with the CAF Southern Minnesota Wing uh, in Minneapolis. We had an event uh, actually at the Air Force Academy for the uh, cadets uh, flyover event with some local Denver and Colorado Springs Airmen. And from there, uh, we were very happy to take it out to Torrance for the first time this aircraft has been on the West Coast. So for the Commandant of Air Force, CAF Mustang, to come out here, it's an it's a exciting time. Uh, we have been working with the Western Museum of Flight for quite some time. Uh, they are aware of the CAF uh, Mustang, been a part of the Los Angeles chapter with Craig Huntley for a number of years and we've talked about having the Mustang out here so I'm glad we can make it happen. And, and this particular plane has been through quite an experience. Uh, can you share a little about what it took to bring the Mustang to us and uh, keep this piece of history alive? Sure, uh, as most people know the CF is composed of volunteers and we go out and uh, fly World War II aircraft. This particular airplane started out as a, uh, a trainer, uh, or if you will, a command trainer back in World War II. Uh, from there, it went to Bozeman State University, and the CAF picked it up back in the 70s and started to do a restoration in the 80s and then 90s. The aircraft was restored for the first time in 2001 and flew until 2004 with the uh, second project leader, Don Hines. Unfortunately, in 2004, we had a catastrophic engine failure and Don Hines perished in this aircraft uh, telling the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. From that point we were able to uh, actually get the blessing of the Hines family to do the second restoration and we were very happy to take it to Oshkosh last year or actually in 2009 uh, and we've been flying the aircraft since and keeping the story of the Tuskegee Airmen alive. Well, thank you for bringing this aircraft to the Western Museum of Flight and to the West Coast to share it with us and share the story of the Tuskegee Airmen with us. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, on behalf of the CAF Southern Minnesota Wing, it's an honor to be here. We're also, as a member of the Los Angeles chapter, very happy to have it out. And uh, we have to say thanks for Bob Friend and uh, Buddy Huntley coming out today to share their stories of being uh, legends and being part of the Tuskegee uh, experience. I'm here today with two of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Bob Friend and Buddy Huntley. Uh, Bob, can you tell us about the unit you served in and uh, what you flew? Well, I was in the 332nd Fighter Group. Uh, I served in first in the 301st Fighter Squadron and then later as a Group Operations Officer uh, when the uh, war was coming to an end. And Buddy, tell us a little about your uh, experience. Well, I was one of the original enlisted men in the 100th Fighter Squadron, and I was in there until to the end of World War II. We just had the privilege of uh, watching you recreate one of the historic photographs from uh, World War II. You were a crew chief on Skipper's Darling, right? Yes. Skipper's Darling, and that was uh, that was flown by Major A.D. Williams. Andrew D. Uh, Turner until he returned and then was sent back to the States after his, his tour of duty. And although this is not the original Skipper's Darling, we had the privilege of recreating the same pose. What did it feel like getting in the uh, cockpit of uh, this Tuskegee Airman Red Tail and recreating that pose? A lot of memories, good memories, very comfortable. And Bob, we got a shot of you up there. Uh, what's it like getting back in the cockpit? Well, like I returned home. I understand there's an interesting story about how quickly you were able to change out the engine in a P-51. We had a section of the engineer's section changed the complete engine in 10 hours. Bob, can you tell us a little about some of your uh, interesting uh, missions? 
Well, uh, one of the things I guess that uh, we always would like to say is that I don't think enough credit was given to these people that kept the airplanes flying. You know, no way in the world you could go on any mission unless that airplane was ready. And I can't ever remember an instance of when they weren't ready. Even for the, for the flight to Berlin, where what they had to do was to drop all of the wing tanks, the external tanks that were on the airplanes, and put on the larger tanks so that they could accommodate the extra mileage. Well, kudos to the crew chief and the crews that made it happen. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, favorite memories from uh, your time in uh, that, serving? That was my favorite memory, the evening of VE Day. Just like he said, we we had to we had to take all the fuel out of the auxiliary tanks, at least at the wing tanks, and then wait for them to bring back the 110 gallon wing tanks and we, we worked all night to get the planes back in order so we would be ready for the mission in the following morning. And that was a long mission, 1400 and some miles round trip. And the group took them all the way into Berlin. About eight hours in some instances. Eight, eight, eight hours. hours, what was it like? Well, I didn't stay up eight hours, but uh, some of the fellas did. They, I know that uh, one fellow named Henry Peoples, uh, actually his engine quit on the approach. He used every last drop that he had. <laughs> are, are there any other uh, interesting stories or memories you'd like to share? Well, first of all, all the enlisted men in the group were all volunteers. There was no draftees in the group at that particular time. And we had to work with what we had. We was battling two fronts, the home front and the, the overseas front. And they didn't give us credit until we got into the P-51s. Then that's when we, I will say, we blossomed. Then everybody start requesting our service. Blossom, you had you had an original, I mean, a, a phenomenal uh, record. Well, one of the things that you can say uh, for our crews is the fact that uh, we, being a segregated outfit, we had to provide all of those services that the others normally were pooling. So. We were really and truthfully, I guess, were the first wing base because we did all levels of maintenance and these fellas really and truthfully did uh, accommodate whatever the requirement was and within the schedule that we were forced to keep. Well, well, that's great that uh, the red tail's uh, been restored and this is making the rounds uh, to help keep the story alive. And uh, we had the privilege of uh, doing a program with uh, uh, someone uh, near and dear to you, uh, Craig Huntley, uh, uh, recently. Uh, and I, I understand he's uh, your Craig's uncle, right? Yes. Yeah, that's my nephew. So he's, uh, you've got the next generation carrying on the uh, torch. That's right, and he's carrying it on. He's doing a wonderful job. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, Bob? Well, I appreciate you gentlemen having us here today. I know that I, for one, got a very big lift out of just being near that airplane again. And I also would like to thank you for the opportunity of coming and seeing history repeat itself because I got a lot of goose pimples when I got into the cockpit. It takes back a whole lot of memories, good memories. I envy the young man for flying. Crazy. I'm here with Craig Huntley. I uh, buddy was Craig's inspiration in uh, getting involved with the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, Craig, can you tell us a little about uh, what you do for the Tuskegee Airmen? Well, I'm currently the uh, historian for the Los Angeles chapter of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. I'm also one of the members of the Harry A. Shepard Research Committee for the Tuskegee Airmen National Organization. I'm an avid uh, researcher, 
I'm the primary researcher for the uh, research committee, and uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, their legacy is my is my passion. Well, there's a photograph that your uncle's hold, holding here, buddy. That's uh, you in the photograph, isn't it? Yes, it is. You haven't changed a bit. Oh yes. <laughs> But you're wearing your original jacket from back then, right? Original Eisenhower jacket. Beautiful. Uh, now, let me tell you a little story about this Eisenhower jacket. Overseas, we cut our khaki shirts off to make Eisenhower jackets. And we was charged for every shirt that we destroyed. You were charged for them? For every one we destroyed. Oh, okay. In the years, they came up with that jacket. This jacket here. Well, it, it's wonderful that you've hung out on to that. Yeah, I gave my, my nephew had it. Good for you, Craig. <laughs> uh, Craig, can you uh, tell us a little about the uh, photograph? And uh, we had quite an opportunity to recreate the uh, pose. Yes, uh, this is a particular photograph of my uncle was taken in 1945. Here he's uh, 19 years old. A uh, photograph was taken in Ramatelli, Italy. Uh, it's on the east coast of Italy, the Adriatic side. He was the crew chief for Captain Andrew Jug Turner, who was the squadron commander of the 100 Fighter Squadron. And that's a very famous uh, uh, plane and uh, uh, pilot, right? Well, well, yes it is. Uh, Jug Turner uh, became the CEO after Captain Tresville was killed. Captain Tresville being uh, the second West Point graduate uh, this century, actually the uh, last yeah, century. century. Uh, Skipper's Darla is one of the most widely photographed airplanes of the 332nd fighter group. Well, uh, thank you for carrying on this history and you're playing such a key role in keeping the memories alive and buddy, your role in making the memories. We're doing the best we can. I'm here with Ted Lumpkin, one of the Tuscany Airmen. It's good to see you again. Good and to see you again, too. And I understand you're president of the LA organization. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I am. I'm a president of uh, the Los Angeles chapter of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. And Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated is a national uh, 501c3 organization, which basically was set up um, probably about 1973 or 4 to tell the story of the Black Air Force during World War II. Uh, most people uh, in this country uh, did not know that there was a Black Air Force and uh, the organization was really uh, uh, one of their um, goals and objectives was to make sure that the uh, country and the world would know something about uh, what happened during the war. And the fact that our um, organization, our, uh, the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, the, uh, well, they weren't known as the Tuskegee Airmen at that time, but the uh, 332nd Fighter Group and the 477th Bomb Group uh, overcame uh, prejudice and uh, the segregation and established a uh, excellent record and uh, got uh, this country started on the uh, um, road to, to uh, equality and much better, uh, um, what would I say, uh, living uh, conditions for all. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what it was like for you being a Tuskegee Airman? Some of the well, experiences. Well, we had a, a lot of uh, different uh, kinds of experiences, but I think the main thing that, uh, that the people should know is that our experiences, we think, were just uh, really ordinary because we were doing uh, the best that we could do uh, each and every day. And the thing that uh, about that is that over a period of time that uh, that accumulates, and um, and the end result, uh, if it's positive every day, will ultimately be positive uh, in, in the end. And uh, that's one of the things that we try to uh, stress to our youngsters: that the uh, importance of uh, education, the importance of stick to it, stick. 
to your uh, goal and your objective and your mission and to make sure that you're doing what you can do to accomplish that. And so we're very, very pleased uh, uh, that, uh, that we were successful. And we think that because we were, uh, that um, the world today is, is better off. And uh, we thought it um, uh, a real gesture that this country made uh, uh, when we received the, the Congressional Gold Medal and uh, President Bush uh, uh, saluted the airmen uh, in recognition of the fact that uh, they'd been slighted many, many times uh, uh, during, their, uh, during their careers. And this uh, proved to be a very emotional uh, uh, experience and event and uh, and I think our organization really appreciated it. And then to the cap it off was when uh, uh, President Obama became president and uh, invited us uh, to his inauguration. And uh, on that uh, cold day in Washington, D.C., it was uh, uh, very, very exhilarating. And uh, we think outstanding. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you for your service. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, it's good seeing you again. And I need to thank you for uh, what you guys are doing and uh, helping uh, us to get our story across. I'm here with Oliver Goodall. He's one of the Tuskegee Airmen. What was it like? It was uh, an experience of a lifetime. You never know what's good for you till you went through it. We went through a lot of things that people up to today would not expect to go through. It was uh, a difference between night and day. Once you get across the Mason-Dixie line, you hit the segregated United States straight in the face. And you had people that would uh, tell you, we don't, just don't like you. We don't want you. But they couldn't keep us away from it. What was it like on the base the when base, you were training? The base was fine. You know, it, uh, our instructors and our commanding officers were white, but they didn't live on the base. So uh, when the night came, we were all black. We had nurses, doctors, lawyers, and everything else. And uh, we survived. That's what it's all about, surviving. If Do it we wasn't for the Tuscany Airmen, a lot of the bombers would not have made it. Well, that's true. Uh, between the 99th and 332nd, they did a beautiful job overseas. Tell us about one of your stories. Well, uh, the one story I really remember is the Freeman Field Mutiny, where 162 officers were arrested and rearrested for going in the White Officers Club against our commanding officer. That's the reason they call it a, a, a mutiny. Anytime you defy your commanding officer doing war, it's a mutiny, whether you're land or sea. <laughs> Tell us about one of the experiences out there defending one of the bombers. Oh, it was something else. They were brave guys. But you know, uh, I've already always said, the American generals fed the Luftwaffe's bodies. Because when they first started the uh, daylight raids, they didn't have enough escorts. And that was a problem. A uh, hundred, hundred planes would go flying up and 40 would come back. They, we said they fed human beings to the Luftwaffe. But, uh, 
they finally overcame that. They got it in order after about a year. And uh, that's when the 332nd and 99th went over. And eventually, they were asked to be part of it. They were asked for them to be escorted. How, how many bombers did you escort? Oh, I, did, I didn't escort any. I was one of the uh, mutineers. <laughs> but uh, they did uh, some 15,000 sorties. And uh, they only lost 66 guys. That was the best deadly record better than anybody else going because they trained us to the point where we were expert in flying we just had to get the technique of flying in combat but uh we overcame that yes you did and uh i think the world is a better place I'm here with Brad Lang. Can you tell us the significance of this P-51 behind us here? Sure, this is the Commandment of Air Force Red Tail Mustang, which is actually based out of Fleming Field in Minneapolis, Minnesota, operated, of course, by the CAF. And what we try to do is support TAI National and take it around the country, the country, to talk about the history and the experiences of the airmen and try to connect with the airmen so people can see the connection between the airmen and the aircraft and the experiences they actually had. And you're one of the pilots. Can you talk about that? It's a great honor and a privilege to fly the aircraft around the country. My father was a Tuskegee Airman uh, who didn't fight in the war, but spent a number of years down there with the uh, Brigadier General uh, Noel Parrish. Uh, there are four pilots on this aircraft, myself, Doug Rosendahl, Paul Stolkoff, and Al Miller. And we're very happy to take it around to the uh, air events and shows. Isn't this the first time it's been in California? Absolutely. For many years, we've talked about having a presence out here. Uh, and I had an event two weeks ago at the Air Force Academy, which was halfway to California. And uh, with the Western Museum of Flight, uh, they were very, very hospitable and gracious to host us while we're out here for about two weeks. What drew you to flying, Paul? My initial interest was my father. Uh, we used to go out to the airport in Newark, New Jersey and watched the airplanes come in, and from there I got into modeling. I still fly RC airplanes. And after that, I eventually got into flying uh, professionally with uh, Delta Airlines. Well, can we have a closer-up look of this P-51, and can you tell us a little bit of the history close-up, as well as can we see the cockpit? Yes, absolutely. Well, the airplane is powered by the Rolls-Royce Packard-built Merlin engine. It develops about 1,500 horsepower. Most of the Mustangs after the A, all of them had the Merlin engines on them. Now, for those of you who want to know a little bit more about the differences between the B and the C model, they're actually identical. The only difference is where they were built. North American had a demand for more Mustangs than they could make out in Los Angeles. So they decided to open up another factory for production in Dallas. So all of the aircraft, the B models that were built in Dallas were called C models. So the B and the C are identical aircraft except for where they were built. The B's in Los Angeles, the C's in Dallas, Texas. The belly scoop on the P-51 Mustang uh, gives it a very, very distinctive silhouette, if you will. And right behind me, you actually get a good view of the distinctive scoop for the radiator and oil cooler. Now the Achilles heel of the aircraft was actually the Radiator, if you were flying low and someone got a lucky shot into your cooling system, that would cause all the fluid to leak out, your engine would overheat, and you'd probably have a seizure. But at altitude, that was less likely to happen. The aircraft actually uh, produced a little bit of thrust from the scoop, about 200 pounds. And that's one of the things that you see when you see that distinctive profile. You always think to yourself, there's that radiator, it must be a P-51. When we originally decided to paint this aircraft, we were going to model it after Jug Turner's P-51C, Skipper's Darling. But later on, we thought it would be a better idea to pay homage to the entire group by having markings from all of the fighter squadrons, which made up the 332nd. 
So on the fuselage, you'll see that small A, which is part of the 99th. And moving forward, the various markings you'll see also were from the 100th Fighter Squadron, the 301st, and the 302nd. So all together, we've got a composite paint scheme representing all of the fighter groups from the 332nd Fighter Group. Next to the CAF logo, we have the By Request. By Request pays homage to Benjamin O. Davis's request to the fighter group to escort the bombers. Initially, back uh, when the Tusky Yerman were flying their missions, they had such a successful escort rate in terms of protecting the bombers that they were requested by other bomber groups who didn't know they were actually African-American aviators. Benjamin O. Davis told his fighter squadrons to strictly protect the bombers without going after the fighters uh, and trying to become an ace. And eventually, the white bomber crews were requesting the Tuskegee fighter pilots from the 332nd. When we look at the uh, empennage of the aircraft, we have the famous red tail. Mustang fighter squadrons, and for that matter, fighter squadrons were actually given different color schemes so they could be readily identified in their different theaters. The Tuskegee pilots were assigned red paint to their tails, and that's why they became known as the Red Tail Angels. So all the Mustangs from Tuskegee either had a lot of red paint or some portion of that tail painted red, signifying they are part of the 332nd fighter group. Earlier we mentioned that the aircraft has a composite paint scheme. Uh, the first group, fighter squadron, they were the 99th uh, fighter squadron, and they actually had dissimilar size markings in terms of numbers and letters. So for the 99th squadron, fighter squadron, we have the small a. And that's why you see on this aircraft the small a, and the other letter, letters or numbers are actually bigger. The C model Mustang is known for its distinctive canopy. It's one of the earlier designs, and the visibility is actually restricted on it. But it does have two different sides to it. The left side, which I'm pointing to right here. And then it actually closes with the clamshell, which is just above my uh, cap. Now, inside the aircraft, you've got all the same features you would have in a North American aircraft in terms of fuel systems, power systems, throttle quadrant, that is. The instruments are about the same as you would have in a T6. However, of course, you've got much more horsepower and a lot more maneuverability because of the design of the aircraft being a fighter. Our C model also has and features 184 gallons of fuel. Normally I fly about two hours. I land, that gives me about a 45 minute reserve. All right, here we have the throttle quadrant. This is the throttle propeller control mixture. These are some of the instruments for the aircraft. Starting on the top, we have the landing gear indicators, which normally would be green if powered up. This is the airspeed indicator, miles per hour, the altimeter the turn coordinator, the vertical speed indicator. This is the stick, of course, for the ailerons and also for the elevator. This is the oxygen regulator, and we have a hose that connects that to make sure you can breathe above 12,500 if you need to use oxygen. Some of the trim controls, or we call them trim wheels, are on the left-hand side of the aircraft. We have controls for the cooler doors below, which we spoke of, the radiator and the oil cooler. The flap control is also on the left. On the right side, we have some of the electrical equipment, battery, alternator. The radios are below the battery switches and the alternator switches. We also have an emergency hydraulic pump lever in case we lose our engine-driven hydraulic pump. Some of the other features inside this aircraft, which you don't have normally, would be the rear seat. Back in World War II, we had a lot of radio equipment, which isn't necessary nowadays. So that gives us the option of putting in a rear seat to take up passengers. Brad, thank you for giving us the walk around of this P-51 and telling us about the significance. Are there any last words? Yes, I'd actually like to thank Cindy Maka, Dana, Aaron from the Western Museum of Flight for having us here. It's been a pleasure working with the Western Museum of Flight. And also for the future, we're developing a trailer to take out on the road to non-aviation sites so we can talk more about the history of the airmen. Uh, and also, if you have any questions, go to redtail.org or the commemorative airforce.org uh, 
uh, website to find out more about what your CAF chapter is doing in your state. I want to frame this discussion as Craig will show the slides with what it was like to be a black American back in the 30s and 40s. And it was an extremely hostile environment. And you have to remember what it's like to remember uh, living under Jim Crow. And for those of you who are too young to understand what Jim Crow is and was, Jim Crow laws were state and federal laws that sanctioned separate and unequal treatment of black Americans in the US. Now, if you can imagine living as a black person in the 30s and 40s, you could shop at a store, but you couldn't sit down at the lunch counter. You could ride a train, but only in a section behind the actual train itself, the engine, or in a colored section only uh, part of the train. If you walked around and you want to get a drink of water, you have to drink out of the colored uh, water fountain. And if you're going to a movie, you're relegated to sitting in the balcony now, if you want to sit in the balcony, that's okay. But sometimes you want to sit down front and watch the movie up close. But you didn't have these options. And this is the um, social environment that the Tuskegee Airmen grew up in. And later on, when we went to war, uh, most of these guys were patriots just like Mike was. And they wanted to fight for their country. So they decided to either uh, volunteer like some of their friends did. My father volunteered because his friend got into the Army Air Corps as well. But when you go down, basically, you're relegated to being a cook, a laborer, or a servant. So the airmen really fought two wars in total. And the war is uh, bigotry and prejudice at home, and overseas, fascism and Nazism. So you know, when you hear the airmen talk about two victories, double V, is one for fighting at home, and one for going overseas and, and finding Hitler. Now, the military in 1925 uh, had an uh, entity, a department called the Army War College. And they produced a report entitled The Use of Negro Manpower in War, which stated that blacks were inferior human beings, not trustworthy, and incapable of going into combat. Now, somewhere along the line, the War College forgot that blacks had volunteered in every major war or conflict, including the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War with the Buffalo Soldiers, Indian Wars, and over 370,000 blacks participated in World War I. But somehow, that was lost when the reports came out in 1925, which basically tempered how the black American as a combat soldier would be looked at, and uh, this is a part of the tone that we're setting for the Tuskegee Airmen and what they had to overcome. So when flying came about in terms of participating in World War II, to be a combat fighter pilot was not an option. But there was intense pressure by the black press uh, and the public to have black pilots. I mean, everybody's paying taxes. You see all the white pilots going over here, or people who are cadets to fly. Why can't I do this too? Even for a country that is not accepting of me in general. Now, the experiment at Tuskegee, and we're going to call that the Tuskegee experiment for right now, was designed to prove that blacks could not fly. It wasn't actually designed to say that they could fly. They wanted to basically support the military and say, listen, the report says that basically they don't have the intellect. Let's just prove it. Now, they didn't pick a spot uh, in New Jersey, which is where I'm from. They didn't pick a spot in Northern California. They picked a spot in one of the most hostile areas or regions of the country, Tuskegee, Alabama. But in Tuskegee, you already had a university down there, Tuskegee University. And there was a flight school in the civilian pilot program being run by Chief Anderson. Now, Tuskegee, Alabama was the initial training point for the military guys. And somewhere along the lines, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt had heard that blacks were trained to fly at Tuskegee. And from what I gather from guys who actually saw her and heard of her, they said she was very strong-willed. And the president basically let her do what she wanted to do. She went down to Tuskegee, and she saw a segregated base. And she saw blacks flying. And she uh, got in touch with the instructor down there, the lead pilot, Chief Anderson, and she said, hey, um, 
would you mind taking me for a ride? I heard they said that blacks couldn't fly, and would you mind taking me for a ride? Chief Anderson uh, said, sure, that's what I do. So she hopped in the airplane, much to the chagrin of the Secret Service agents who said, don't go. You can't go with that guy. You know, you, something bad is going to happen to you. She rode around the pass, just like we all do here at the airport. She got out of it and she goes, I don't know what they're talking about. That was a pretty good ride to me. Um, I should probably say something to my husband. And Chief Anderson was like, oh, I'm glad you enjoyed the ride. So I'm very sure that Eleanor went back and said, honey, these guys are getting a terrible reputation down there for not being able to fly. And I flew with Chief Anderson. It was a fine flight. We should probably support them and what they're trying to do down there and become uh, a military fighting group. And so that being said, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was uh, helpful in supporting the airmen as they began their task of training. And the tone was set for the training at Tuskegee. Now at this point, we're gonna do a couple of things. Craig Huntley's gonna come up and introduce himself. And we're gonna show you some slides from the 1940s, and as an aviation, and I say this uh, with tongue in cheek, as a nerd, I think I've seen every, or at least I used to think, until I met Craig, that I've seen all the slides and photos and all the books. But Craig has some color slides that he will show you that are actually not enhanced, but actually from the day. And it will show you the base, it will show you some of the maps, and some of the personnel and aircraft, and the events that were going on in Tuskegee back in the 40s. And when we typically think of Tuskegee Airmen, normally you think of just the fighter pilots. Uh, I got a scolding one time by Craig's uncle who was the crew chief for Skipper's Darling. And he said to me, uh, Brad, you know that without us, the pilots would never leave the airport or leave the base. So remember that to support one pilot basically it takes about 10 people. And there would be no fighter pilot without a great crew chief and the support staff that goes into that. Just like you can't have a winning quarterback without a great line or a winning team without a great line on a football squad. So uh, the term Tuskegee uh, is a broad term which incorporates those who worked administration, those who were nurses, those who were mechanics, those who were supply officers. It's a broad group. And this group is dying at about one a week. Uh, I think last night, uh, Rusty Burns, a fighter pilot with Tuskegee, said to me that there are roughly 108 pilots left. The support personnel, maybe a few hundred. But uh, these legacies from World War II, the greatest generation, are dying as all uh, of the greatest generation are passing away. And we need to continually remind others of their great histories and the history of this country. My name is Craig Huntley and I'm the historian for the Los Angeles chapter of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. I'm honored to be here to give you this lecture and to show you this slideshow. Brad left off with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and exactly where I'm going to pick up at. This here is the uh, flight that started it all. What you see here is Chief Anderson in the cockpit who was the chief flight instructor at Tuskegee Institute at the time, the CPT program, and Lewis Jackson, who was the overall director of training. Eleanor flew for about an hour. That's a J3 Piper Club. He took off out of Moton Field. I want you to understand there are two actual airfields at Tuskegee, Alabama. The first one is Moton Field, which actually belonged to the Institute. And that's where the Tuskegee Airmen received their primary training in either the PT-17, PT-13, or the PT-22. And that's where this flight originated from. The second field is Tuskegee Army Airfield, which is located about seven miles away. That's the Army Air Force field, staffed by nothing but military personnel, and that's where the Tuskegee Airmen received their basic and advanced flight training. Eleanor here flew about 45 minutes to an hour with Chief Anderson. They went all the way down to Birmingham, and I'm not sure if they did any aerobatics in that J-3, but I'm pretty certain he did something pretty good uh, to, to win her over to go back and talk to her husband. In 1995, I was involved in competitive aerobatic flying. I was flying a uh, Super Decathlon in Texas, then I started flying a Pitts S2B in competition, and then later on an extra 300. 
and I made the uh, 1999 advanced uh, U.S. team and competed in the Czech Republic at the World Championships. At that time, there was a gentleman, Phil Shaft, from Minnesota, South St. Paul, Minnesota, who was involved with an organization called the Commemorative Air Force. Now, for those of you who don't know, and anyone can join the Commemorative Air Force, it consists of a group of volunteers operating and supporting World War II aircraft. The home base is in Midland, Odessa, Texas. The Commemorative Air Force was formerly the Confederate Air Force. And for all those who wonder, uh, the Confederate Air Force is dead, and the personnel uh, basically have changed their attitudes and changed the structure of the uh, organization to be inclusive, whereas before they were exclusive. And that also is on a generational uh, level. I thought a great way of preserving the history of men like Brigadier General Mike McCarthy and my father's history was to stop what I was doing and join the Commemorative Air Force. Uh, I always thought it'd be great to fly fighters. Uh, my friend Phil Schaff was flying a B-25 in Minnesota with the South St. Paul uh, wing. The Commemorative Air Force has many wings around the United States and also the world. There are probably 11,000 members worldwide, over 70 wings. The particular group in Minnesota had uh, access to a P-51C model Mustang. Now remember the C model is the rare Razorback version like Scott's C model here. Thanks Scott for bringing the aircraft here. The D model has a bubble canopy for increased visibility. The South uh, or Southern Minnesota wing was restoring this aircraft, had no funds until Don Hines became, who was the uh, project leader at the time, came on board he was enamored with the history of the airmen and how they overcame so much adversity in the past and how very few people knew about the story. And he thought, what a great universal story to have, not just for blacks, but just for everyone to say, hey, listen, if these guys could do it, as I said earlier, anyone can do it through dedication of purpose, uh, persistence, and determination. And so I thought, you know, if I have an opportunity to tell a story and reach out to others because I'm getting out of an aircraft that looks like the Tuskegee Airmen's Group. Uh, I think that is a great opportunity to expand one's horizon and influence others because the greatest generation uh, has a story that just cannot be diminished and should not uh, uh, fall away from the history books. And that's why I decided to join the Southern Minnesota Wing and became a part of this restoration effort called the Red Tail Project. Now, the aircraft that we restored uh, back in 2001, as I said, was a effort of volunteers. Uh, it was essentially a vocational training tool at a Bozeman State College. Uh, they were gonna get rid of the aircraft for scrap heat and, and give it to the scrap heat until someone said from the uh, wing, hey, we can restore this because we can use this Mustang with our B-25. And in telling the story of the B-25 in the restoration, they found out that it was escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen. So that changed perspective on, hey, listen, this story has some synergy. We can have a B-25, we have a C-model Mustang in Tuskegee colors escorting the B-25. Who's in favor? Everybody in Minnesota raised their hands at the wing. And I thought, hey, great, all the Airmen are getting older, and unless I get involved in this, uh, I'll be 80 years old and it will never have uh, been done. And so I dropped what I was doing with the competitive aerobatics. I took out a second mortgage on the house, bought the T-6, and dedicated the past 10 years to getting involved with the P-51C to keep the history alive of my dad's group. Now, unfortunately, in 2004, our project leader, Don Hines, uh, had a catastrophic engine failure and was killed in a crash at an air show at Red Wing, Minnesota. I was there uh, when the crash happened. Um, the airplane was completely destroyed. Uh, we did a press conference at the time. We thought basically that the aircraft was done. I lost a good friend in the accident. His wife was there, one of his kids was there. We were just devastated. 
And then while we were giving the press conference, a restoration person named Jerry Beck said, guys, uh, all is not lost. We want to take all the pieces, and when you're ready, I can restore this aircraft. It's going to take a lot of money. You're going to have to go out and fundraise. But it is possible to refabricate and take some of the old parts, get a lot of new parts, and have the aircraft flying again. And we were all in shock. We just thought it couldn't be done. And Jerry Beck said, you know, I've restored worse. Well, we basically thought, well, let's go out and ask the family of Don Hines first. So we approached the Hines family just after Pat's husband was killed in the aircraft, and I might say just after, within a year, and we uh, broached the subject, and she said, you know, Don would be extremely upset if you guys and gals didn't go out there and try to make that dream happen, to tell the story about the Tuskegee Airmen. And in fact, uh, Don had wanted me to fly the aircraft uh, back in 2004. I was actually getting checked out in the aircraft the night prior to the crash. So it was probably making metal when I was flying the aircraft with Doug Rosendahl. So that being said, I'm going to show you a um, slide of what the aircraft looked like after the crash in the backyard of a neighborhood so that you get a perspective on where we came from to where we are today. You can see in this crash, this is maybe about five or ten minutes after the crash, the devastation. And remember, my good friend Don Hines lost his life in this crash. So from here, what I want to show you is the DVD that we have on what actually was involved in getting the aircraft back up and flying. It has been five long years since the accident that destroyed the Red Tail and claimed Don Hines' life. Once again, this Mustang is prepped for flight by the restorers of Tri-State. Well, it's, it's evolved over the years, but uh, primarily now it works on and restores and builds parts for uh, World War II airplanes, namely the P-51 Mustang. Um, you know, Don had the idea and the funding behind it, and it was Jerry's shop, and it's like, okay, we have this airplane to build, let's build it. Finished components, painted parts, and refurbished systems are now finally coming together. For three years, steady progress was made on restoring the aircraft. Then tragedy struck the project once again. Um, two years ago, uh, Beck was uh, participating in um, an air show activity and was killed um, there. And uh, he was flying his A-model Mustang, which, which was, uh, you know, pretty near and dear to him. After the accident, you know, the question is, well, what's going to happen to Tri-State Aviation? And it's like, well, we have to continue on. We're still here. We're, the capabilities are still here. Uh, the vision that he had is, I think, with us. I think we hold that yet. And so that helped in moving forward with the CAF project as well, with the Red Tail. And it, it really, the, that project is so huge that um, it's just been uh, probably an honor for all of us to be part of that. Tri-State pressed on to complete the Mustang, along with the help of Red Tail Project volunteers. Yeah, I've got a, a pretty good crew. Uh, we don't really have an exact count. We've, there's five or six guys that are kind of my key guys, kind of the main guys that have, that have come up here uh, on a, a regular basis, and uh, it's been a great help with the project. The, the thing that I like about it the most, though, too, it's, it's kind of a learning experience. You know, 
these are the guys that are going to help maintain the airplane once it's flying and to get the experience of working with the airplane and, and being all the way down to the minute detail of it to understand how the systems work is, is I think going to be a, a great value to the, to, the, to the wing down there to have those people. As the first flight date nears, the focus and work intensify. It, it's hard to focus on a project and, and to get it to the finish and the excitement builds and everybody wants to see it fly and, and you know we get a lot of people come in to want to see how the project's coming they want to be here to see it fly. Um, Jerry's thought was always well we're going to sneak it out the back door and we're going to fly it once and then we're going to call them up and say okay we're ready to fly. Well we didn't get that luxury this time and it gets a little tense when you're trying to finish the last details and there's things you know you have to concentrate on and do it just right and when you have a whole bunch of people standing over you looking at you questioning whether you're going to be able to do it right or not it kind of wears on a person and tempers get a little short but among the crowd of visitors a guest with a special connection to the project has arrived I was uh, amazed to see Ben Hines uh, I had heard that he was coming and and when he walked into the the shop I was just elated to see him Marine Captain Ben Hines, son of Don Hines, has come to see his father's dream once again take flight. To me, that was huge. It, it made, for myself personally, it, it made it more of a, you know, somewhat of a true mission accomplished. After a long restoration road, it is finally time to do some flying. It continues. Uh, this airplane is uh, nicer than it was last time. That's an incredible testament to uh, to Tri-State, to back to Cindy, to all the people that Beck chose to be part of his team here. You know, I mean, and it's exciting for me too, of course. I mean, it's kind of one of those you like to see the project through and see it get done and get it out there so people can enjoy it. It was pretty spontaneously amazing and exhilarating and um, 
those that have experienced uh, a child coming into the world, I'm sure that uh, you could equate it to that. And it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's bittersweet in a way. Um, the playing uh, took on, uh, it's a story larger than itself. Uh, the story that Tuskegee Airmen, the story that the, the project wants to tell, that the, it's almost expanded beyond the airplane. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today, was to be a part of that and to, to let the project know that we as a family are still supporting the story that they want to tell. It's history, you know. Everybody forgets history, so. If, you, if that airplane was restored like it is and put in a, a museum somewhere, the number of people that would get to see it would be really small. And when you actually get to see it fly, then everybody, wow, that's, that's cool, you know, that's exciting. I, I mean, this is not the end, this is the beginning. It's the beginning of a whole new phase, but it really is. This was not the goal. This is the beginning. I'm just looking forward now to, now that the aircraft is flying and will be back in the air, is um, trying to put the whole project together, the Red Tail Project, so that they can truly go out and accomplish their mission in, in uh, telling about the Tuskegee Airmen and um, just the mission about what, what are you gonna do with your life? We can celebrate, rejoice, enjoy for a little while, but the, the real mission is to tell the story of the Tuskegee Airmen and to inspire young people to realize that they can be whatever they dream. And that's what Don set out to do. And so this is just the first step, albeit a big one, in a long journey. And uh, knowing Don as I do, he's tapping me on the shoulder saying, okay, now let's get to work. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>